So good morning, this is the 18th uh, lecture of computer control. And uh, today we are going to address adaptive and predictive control, MPC. MPC comes from model-based predictive control. In Portuguese, control predictive baseado in models. And we are going to, to see how to use what we have studied so far in connection to these two concepts that and also to see how they can make uh, work together. Adaptive control um, comes, the, the, the first idea was from Kalman. You have heard of Kalman from the Kalman filter at least. And uh, introduced many ideas. He was, he was seen his, himself as a mathematician more than an engineer, but he developed uh, many important concepts for control engineering. And he was picking them in uh, out of uh, estimation theory, mathematics, and physics. And physics, for instance, uh, he was the one who introduced the um, the Lyapunov stability theory that was developed originally in the 19th century for physics. Uh, he introduced this technique for to study control systems, the stability of the control systems. And uh, in 57, he published a paper uh, about adaptive control. Okay. Actually, he tried to build one thing. I think it was not a successful uh, work, but uh, the technology at the time was very poor. Uh, the, the, the paper can be found, and uh, you can see pictures of the the dedicated computer he built to implement an adaptive controller. And I'm going to speak about that, not exactly the idea of Kalman, but related to that. And uh, MPC in the linear case, well, you can find roots also in the 60s. So about uh, more than half a century ago. But um, it was the starting years in which uh, MPC started to linear MPC started to be work to be used uh, were in the 80s, so about 40 years ago, in connection with the control of distillation columns. And it were uh, they were engineers of Shell of the Shell company, and they had this problem. Uh, today they were distillating crude from uh, one origin. And the next week, they were distillating crude from another origin. And they had to retune the controllers. So they needed um, high performance controllers that could be easily uh, retuned. And uh, they found that MPC was um, ideal for that. In particular, because this is the big, biggest advantage of MPC, you can explicitly incorporate constraints. That is to say, uh, you can say my manipulated variable is uh, say between 10% and uh, 60%, or my temperature is between uh, um, 100 degrees and 200 degrees, and enforce that in the controller, which is usually very difficult. And uh, for that, in MPC, the control design is algorithmic. Uh, when, you, when you start having uh, constraints, you no longer have a transfer function uh, or um, difference equation that describes the, con the controller. Difference equation in, in the compact way that you usually write it. You have an algorithm, and this algorithm is related to optimization algorithms. So that's the reason of uh, the uh, popularity of MPC, the possibility to incorporate constraints. Of course, uh, this results in uh, algorithms, control algorithms, that require a lot of computation. And uh, for many years, you could not use them, say, on board, for instance. But at this moment, uh, there are at least experimental planes and even cars that uh, um, control their motion 
or their engines using MPC. And um, there, we, there are um, uh, feasibility studies con being conducted by ESA, ESA is European St uh, Space Agency, uh, for the application of MPC to the control of uh, satellites, of aircraft, of uh, spacecrafts. Then, in, uh, in the beginning of the 90s, so 10 years after the idea became popular in the, for the linear, for linear models, uh, MPC for nonlinear models was also introduced. Okay. So what I want to, to give you is an idea of adaptive control and MPC. Okay. There are several methods for adaptive control that you can use, several approaches that you can use for adaptive control. You can, uh, th this was, this is a popular one. I can't say it was one of the first because uh, actually, another idea came, and I will mention it briefly, more or less at the same time. So the idea is, uh, we know how to design a controller based on a plant model. And we also know how to estimate the parameters of a plant model. So let's estimate the parameters of the plant model online. So I'm receiving data from the process and as a, at the same time I'm receiving the data, I'm updating the parameters of the model, the estimates of the parameters of the model, and then I'm recalculating the gains of the controller, and then I update the controller. Okay, so this is the block diagram in which you have an adapter, this uh, this large uh, square that consists of what? It receives I.O. data from the plant, U and Y, so U is the manipulating variable, Y is the output. You have a recursive least squares estimator that estimates the parameters of a plant model, okay, typically linear, and then based on this you recalculate the gains of the controller. Uh, for instance, you uh, assume that you are using uh, minimum variance control and you compute the gains and then you change the gains of the controller in a standard feedback loop okay now uh, we should be careful because this is a quite plausible idea this is a quite natural idea but we are introducing uh, a structure that can make those problems because you see that apart from this uh, usual feedback loop that uh, comes from the output of the process to the controller, you are having also a nonlinear feedback loop that passes through the estimator and the computation of the gains. Okay? And you can have strange behaviors. Typically, you should do uh, this update of the parameters at a slower time scale than the uh, time scales of the process in the controller okay so there should be some some uh, difference in time scales and you should be slower in updating the gains than in making the control action which is also quite natural because if uh, you are changing quite fast the gains then or uh, because we are changing quite fast the parameters, then your controller uh, can uh, have uh, strange dynamics. Uh, actually, this idea sometimes works and sometimes does not work. It relies on the type of controller, or for it to work, it relies on the type of controller. Not all controllers are able to. to um, make this system stable and a good estimator and a good estimator okay let me show you one example in this example uh, you see it's very old it was published in 1965 
And uh, the idea is this. Suppose that you have a system uh, in which Y is the output, U is the input, and E is a sequence of the white noise, the famous white noise. Okay, now, uh, we don't have access to E. And we try to estimate A with least squares. And least squares is blind to C. Just see some, some disturbance. So, um, we assume that the model is some, is written as it is here with some uh, noise. Okay, with some noise. And uh, we assume that the noise is white, but it is not white. Okay. So uh, my optimal controller is the estimate of parameter theta times yk. Why? Because if you replace by uk by theta hat yk, then these two terms cancel if theta hat is close to theta. And yk plus one is just a noise. Okay, and you can't do better than this if the noise is white. Okay. Now we have a problem because uh, theta, theta hat does not converge to the hopefully true parameter, true value of theta, which should be a, because of the fact that the noise is not white. Okay. Now uh, it happens. Uh, on the other way, that your controller, your minimum variance controller, should be more complicated because I'm ignoring the fact that V is not white. So we have uh, two problems associated to V not being white. One is the polarization of the estimate. So the estimate is in error, as a systematic error, the so-called bias. The other problem comes from the fact that the minimum variance control law is not this one. It depends on C that I don't know. But uh, uh, let's be a little bit stupid or naive if you want and put everything together. So I estimate theta, assuming that this is the model and I estimate it with um, uh, recursively squares and I use this control law, okay? And what happens is that this is very rare in general. These two errors compensate, and actually, uh, the gain of the controller converges to the optimal gain that you would uh, uh, have if you knew A and C, and you knew that this was colored was colored noise. Okay, let me show you one example. So suppose that uh, uh, we have A equal to minus 0.9, C equal to minus 0.3. Uh, you can uh, solve the minimum variance problem, assuming that you know A and C, and the gain that should multiply this gain here, that should multiply YK should not be theta hat, but should be A minus C. Okay, that's the optimal gain. And for these values, the optimal gain should be minus 0.6. Now, let's see what happens when we use this naive approach. So we estimate theta that we expect to go to A, but does not go to A. Assuming that the noise is white, so I'm using recursively squares, and then I apply this control law, which also assumes that the noise is white. And the nice thing is that you have the straight line the straight line marked by the error is the optimal minimum variance control. And the blue line that is converging converges to the true value of uh, minimum variance. Okay, so this is why this, um, uh, this controller was called self tuning okay? because despite the fact that we ignore we don't know anything about the noise statistics, so the fact that it is correlated, it could discover it is and converges there. Of course, this uh, happens 
for some class of plants, for instance. Uh, if your plant has a non-minimum phase zero, non-minimum variance control will not work. Okay? And uh, you know that there will be an instability in the manipulating variable that in the end will uh, saturate and force the output also to become unstable. Uh, but for minimum phase plants, also, you also have to impose some technical conditions on the value of C. It's not for all the possible values of C, but it's quite a lot. Um, it's not exactly the, the values of C that render the polynomial 1 plus or Z plus C stable. It's a little bit more limited than that. Then uh, you you... Uh, you have this property that these two errors of estimation because of colored noise and the fact that you are having a wrong uh, gain because again you are ignoring the fact that the noise is colored converge to the correct value of the gain. Okay, <coughs> this can be proved. Um, the proof that the minimum variance gain is an equilibrium one it's not so difficult it's in the book of uh, Asterman Wittenmark and it's just off the page the argument is very simple it's relatively simple uh, proving that you converge then it's more uh, much more complicated and uses uh, uses more uh, complicated uh, arguments actually the proof was done only in the beginning of the 80s, so uh, about uh, 15 years later, then the algorithm came out. Let me give you another example in which of this scheme. Okay, so one possibility is uh, you have an RMAX process. You assume that you you just have an RX, so you you discard the moving average part, the, the part with the noise, you estimate the parameters with recursive with squares, and you compute the gains with minimum variance. And you have a minimum variance controller here. Okay, that's one possibility. But you can do this in other ways. Uh, for instance, uh, uh, you can do pole placement. You can do pole placement. Let's see one example of pole placement. Suppose that we have uh, this mode, this um, example of an electrical motor. Okay? Remember that uh, uh, this corresponds to the sampling on a, of an electrical motor. The output is the angular position, and the input is the tension applied to the motor, normalized between some values. Uh, so. Uh, Z equal to one is one pole, corresponds to the integration associated that relates angular velocity with angular position. And the pole at A um, relates the tension applied to the motor to the velocity, to the angular velocity. And then there is a zero due to sampling. Doesn't, it's not present in the continuous time uh, model, but it's, it appears due to, due to sampling. Okay, now, Let's uh, write the different situation. Let's write a different situation uh, corresponding to this uh, discrete model, discrete uh, uh, frequency response. And uh, you know that, uh, well, this should not be E equal, but should be uh, this. Z this term here applied to y of t. So it's a misprint. Okay, equals to k z minus b u k minus one. And I previously multiplied uh, above and below by q minus two. So q minus two that gives me here one and b z minus one. And there is an extra z minus one that you see here appears u t minus one. 
Now I have I have this integration term here. So what I'm going to do is to compute the, the difference or approximation of the derivative of y. I call it delta y. So delta y is my one minus q minus one y t. So what is this? Is nothing more than y t minus y t minus one. And uh, this is something that I can easily compute because uh, I have my y t and I differentiate the last two samples. And my model becomes like this. Okay, my model becomes like this. So, so uh, now the input is u and the output is delta. And we have as parameters a, k, uh, there is a b that should be in kb, okay, in minus kb, okay. So we can define this regressor, this regressor, delta y t minus one, u t minus one, and u t minus two. And you estimate the parameters, which is a, k, and minus kb. So if you estimate theta one, theta two, and theta three, you can know that uh, the estimate of A is theta one, the estimate of K is theta two, and the estimate of B is theta three divided by the estimate of theta two with a minus sign. Okay, so you can map easily theta one, theta two, and theta three in A, K, and B. And with this uh, definition of the regressor and the vector of parameters, you, you can write the linear regression model and you can estimate theta or the true value of theta that I call theta O uh, using recursively squares. So you end up with an algorithm which is you, you read yt and of course also ut. And you compute the difference, yt minus yt minus one, you have yt minus one in memory. And then you use recursively squares to estimate the parameters in this regression model. So you compute the Kalman gain, you update the parameters, and then you update the covariance matrix. Then you compute the estimates of A, K, and B using the formulas that we have seen previously. And then you solve, you, then you solve uh, a pole placement problem using uh, polynomial methods, imposing the poles of the desired polynomial to be the roots of z squared plus p z plus p2 and you know that this P1 and P2 can come from uh, uh, the sampling of a second order system. We have discussed that before. And if you solve this, if you solve this problem, you get that the gains of the controller are given in this way as a function of the estimates of the parameters. Okay. And you apply to the motor this control law. So it's a linear combination. You see the reference, <coughs> white is the input, is the output, yt minus one is the input as a previous sample, and ut minus one is the manipulated variable, the previous manipulated variable. You initialize the vectors as zero, one, zero, and the, co the initial covariance matrix is 1000 I. So 1000 I, be why? Because you say I have little information, so my initial error is very high, so I say it's diagonal uh, with uh, in very high. So 1000 is very high. Here I could have placed 0, 0, 0, but then I have a problem because there appears to be and estimate a division by theta two when I compute beta hat. 
So if I started with zero, I would immediately have a numerical problem by dividing by zero. So I put a number which is not zero and I put one. Okay. Let's see some results. This is a, in simulation. These are simulation results. So you have uh, here the red line is the reference that you want to track for the position of the motor. The blue line is the actual position. And here, this is a manipulated variable. And on the right, you can see the controller gains. Okay, computed in the way I explained. So estimating the parameters with recursively squares and then recomputing the gains. In the first five seconds, so more or less up to here, uh, the motor is open loop, and I'm just applying, you see here, a tiny, uh, small, random signal. Uh, small, random, a random signal, signal of small amplitude, so that uh, you excite the system and allow your um, estimates to converge. Actually, they, they take longer to converge, so... It's about 12 seconds or a little bit more than 10 seconds. But for the first five seconds, we were working in open loop to help them converge. Uh, in general, I add, and this is quite important, I add a small so-called deter. Deter means to agitate, agitation, noise detail noise uh, to the control. So the control is not just, the controller is not just this, but it's this plus some uh, random variable, white variable, multiple with very small amplitude. So the standard deviation is small, so I multiply it, I generate uh, random numbers with MATLAB, uh, in the Gaussian distribution, and then I multiply them by a very small factor, typically 0 0.01. And this is quite important because it gives some excitation that allow you to allow your parameters to converge. This problem is so simple that I think that I have even turned off uh, this deter, and you see that there is an initial there is an initial uh, transient corresponding to adaptation transient and then uh, gains converge and converge to the to the optimal values are quite close to that okay. so the the bullets these bullets indicate the optimal values and you see that you we have converged to them in this case, this is a simulation, so we know everything. Okay. Any question about this, these examples? Okay, so uh, we have seen this idea of adaptive control in two ways, in two types of, uh, or two families of algorithms. Uh, recursively squares to identify the model, plus minimum variance, and recursively squares plus uh, pole placement, okay? And you can apply this to, uh, to other control strategies. Now, uh, we have seen, we have seen that um, the minimum variance is not able to control non-minimum phase planes. And uh, last week, I, I told you that one possibility to improve the design is to add a weight on the manipulated variable. So instead of minimizing uh, the expected value of y squared, you add some weight, let's call it rho or r, r uh, times u squared, okay? But only at one sample. Now, uh, this uh, prevents U from growing, it is true, but if your plant is simultaneously unstable and 
non-minimum phase, that is to say with zeros outside the unit circle, then you are not able to stabilize with this control law. So for that you need uh, adaptive, or sorry, model predictive control, and uh, I will start first about adaptive model predictive control, and then I will also speak about non-adaptive model predictive control. I will say something about that. Now, model predictive control explores one technique, which is receiving horizon. It's a so receiving horizon strategy. In Portuguese, it could be something like uh, horizon fugidio. Imagine that you are driving your car. Okay? Uh, if you have very little experience, maybe you are very nervous, so you look at what happens um, five meters away from the car, and uh, if it is free, you, you accelerate, but then if you find some obstacle, you have to brake suddenly, okay? Uh, so uh, you are driving your car in a very nervous way. Suppose now that you gain experience, you are an exp experienced driver. You don't look five meters ahead from your car. You look to an horizon up to 100 meters, okay? And in both cases, the horizon slide in front of you. But uh, now you look at much further uh, points. So you see that uh, uh, at five meters, you have, uh, everything is um, free, the way is free. But 100 meters away, you have some sheep crossing the road, okay? So you um, uh, reduce the velocity of the car instead of breaking it down immediately, but you re reduce it to give time for the sheep to cross the road. And then when everything is free again, you can retake your velocity and so on. So you, you base your um, decisions on predictions on the future. Okay. You are making predictions about the future on a much lighter, larger horizon. Okay. That allow you to uh, have smoother control action, smoother control action on the car and avoid instabilities. That's the idea of receiving horizon strategy. So let's put it in mathematical terms. Suppose, let, call T the discrete time, okay? So let's call T the present discrete time. And you look uh, at the horizon, at an horizon, uh, up to T plus capital T. And what you want to do, you want to find out UT, your manipulated variable at time, so uh, what you do, you imagine uh, what happens, you do predictions on Y over the horizon. So these bullets that have no, no uh, interior, so these white bullets represent predictions of Y. You have a time T, you have observed Y up to time T, so you have Y T, Y T minus one, Y T minus two, etc. You know ut minus one, ut minus two, etc. Okay, in the past. And let's assume you know the reference. Okay, if you don't know the reference, you have to do a prediction of the reference. Let's assume you know the reference that you want to track. So uh, instead of for selecting you such that you go to the reference in one step, you say that I'm going to approach the reference along the horizon. Okay, so my y. Uh, should approximate the reference after the horizon capital T. Uh, and you, how do you do that? You uh, optimize, you define a cost function that measures these errors between predicted var var variables, values for Y and the reference over the horizon, not just the first point, but along the whole horizon, okay? 
Of course, this will not depend on just UT. It will depend on UT plus one, etc. Okay. So what you what are you going to do? You are going to uh, define a cost function, say the sum of the squares of the errors. Okay. Uh, this is a function of UT and U ca plus capital T minus one. There is a delay of one. I'm assuming there is a delay of one. Okay. So I use my predictive models. I use my predictive models to, uh, to solve this problem, to express y in terms of u. Then I became with a function of u, but u between t and t plus capital T minus 1. And then I solve with respect to all of this t. Now, I could have applied all this t and then repeat everything when I come to uh, t equal to t plus capital T. But instead of doing that, I'm going to discard all the u's between t plus 1 and t plus capital T minus 1 and retain just the first. This is the idea of receding horizon. So you take, you, you do a plan, then you retain just the first step of the plan, you do one move, and then you remake the plan. That's the idea. Any question? Professor, but mm -hmm. now we need to make several plans, right, for each time instance or no? Uh, you do one, just one plan, but with several moves. Okay. okay? You do okay. One, one plan, and your plan, for me, a plan is to have the sequence ut, ut plus one, ut plus two, etc., up to ut plus capital T minus one. You solve, you minimize the cost function and you get all of them. But my question here is um, a little bit different because if we make a plan, okay, and then we discard uh, from t plus one to t minus one, and we just retain our one. And for example, we can think that our model is very good. So if we apply u of t, we will get a very similar result in, to what we have planned for y of t plus 1. Mm -hmm. Then we are just, um, we are redoing all these calculations and we are not gaining much advantage, or are we? OK, Marcel is saying MPC is rubbish because you can just compute. No, 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 I know MPC is good, but uh, no, I it's, a, it's a good <laughs> argument. You are raising a very, a very good point. Okay. Uh, what am I gaining with all this stuff of uh, sending back, sending what I have just calculated? Okay. Up to now, I don't have, I'm not making an exemption on improving the model. Okay. Let's assume we have a fixed model. So, not yet adaptation. So, the model is perfect. If the model is perfect, from the next move on, I should get the same sequence, or not? Yeah, that's the thing. Because in the perfect world, it, it would happen. But in reality, it might have slight differences. It can, there can be large differences, because you are forgetting okay. disturbances. OK? If you have a disturbance that acts, uh, then uh, you should change your plan. Okay. okay, so uh, this story of receding horizon is a way of transforming uh, optimal control, which was just compute the optimal sequence of use, into feedback control. Optimal control is usually, um, it gives you a plan. I mean, apart from some special cases, but uh, in many cases, uh, if you optimize with respect to one variable, then uh, you, what you do is a plan of action. So it's a kind of offline, offline planning. Apart from the example of um, LQ control is different because you optimize and you get a feedback controller. But that is very, very particular. Usually, you, what you get is a plan of action. Okay? And if something happens, uh, you have prepared your plan of actions, and uh, this is blind what and what is going to happen, okay? So, uh, in this way, by discarding all the moves but the first one and recalculating things, 
you are introducing a feedback. Why? Because the disturbance will act on why, will change why. And then you are uh, recomputing things. And since why is different, your plan will be different. So you are responding to disturbances. Is this clear? Yes, thank you. So the, the big point, and this is a very big, this is a, a very important point, is this technique of receiving horizon. It's a very powerful uh, control uh, idea. Allow you to transform uh, optimal control um, law into a feedback control law that allow you to counteract uh, disturbances. Okay. Okay. So let's move. Now uh, we can have a, a large variety of costs. Okay. Let's think of this basic. Uh, quadratic cost. Um, I have here sto the stochastic part, but if, if this looks complicated to you, okay, forget about the stochastic part. Now, what we have? I want to drive y to zero. Remember that y is the deviation. If if uh, I have a, an explicit reference here, I would have y minus r squared. Okay, y minus r squared. And I have here the manipulated variable squares. And this is sum from one to t. So if you look here, uh, y uh, exists from, uh, from here, t plus one up to t plus capital T. Because remember, yt already has been observed. You cannot change it. So you start at t plus one. And ut goes from time t up to capital T minus t plus capital T minus one, so one less. Okay, so if you look here, you i ranges from one to t, so y ranges from t plus one to t plus capital T, and u is delayed by one minute. Okay, and this is an expected variable of the sum of squares given the observations up to time t. And this row is a weight that should be zero or positive. Okay, it tells you that your u should not grow too much. Now, what do you do to minimize this? We need a plan. Uh, you, we need a plant model that relates u with y. Okay, and um, if we have this Rx model, okay. I haven't proved it, but it's an extension. It's an extension of the methods that we have studied. Actually, the slides are there, but I jumped them if you are curious about it. Uh, you can compute the parameters of this. You see, you are at time t, and uh, you want to compute the output, an estimate of the output, so prediction of the output, j plus one steps ahead. J plus one is just a convention I put written here J and then there will be a minus one here. So what is this? What is this? This is the sum of two parts, this part here and this second part here. This second part here, this pi transpose is a vector of coefficients that depends on A and B. Okay. And this is a kind of state, it's a non-minimum state. Okay. Actually, it's not really a state, so I call it sometimes a pseudo state. But okay, let's think it's a state. And it's made of samples of y, yt, yt minus one, up to yt minus n plus one. So you have n samples of y. Typically, n is the, the order of the plant. And then you have m samples of u. m is the number of zeros. Okay. And uh, uh, of course, your, your signal is y is equal to the prediction plus something which is not y, but is orthogonal to the data. Okay. If this is com confusing to you, forget about this term. And so my prediction has Two terms. So uh, a linear combination of the state at time t, 
that's the free regime. If you don't have, if you don't apply any other uh, control, then uh, the future use would be decaying according to this term. Okay, pi would would, would depend on j on the horizon at which you are predicting. Okay, so the, this is the natural decay of of, of the system signals. Okay, the natural response. And then you have a linear combination of future use. Okay, maybe we can write it in this way. So one step ahead predictor is W1 some number ut plus some vector times st, okay, plus some error, prediction error. Okay. Uh, y of t plus two, now you have a combination of ut plus one and ut, these are the free ones. And then here you have a combination of past data. Okay, so this is a free regime. This is a so called forced regime. And so on, y of t plus capital T is a linear combination between start here, ut, ut plus one, etc., ut plus one, t minus one. Okay, plus the natural regime, which is some pi, I call it t, pi index t, st. A linear combination of the data at time t. So st is always is always given by the same signals that you are you know at time t, and the other part is a kind of convolution sum of future values. Okay. Now uh, you can place this in the quadratic cost and get the famous generalized predictive controller. Uh, proposed by Clark and Matadi in 1980 and then published in a journal in 1984. Clark was a professor at Oxford University and Matadi was a PhD student of Clark. Okay, so how does it look like? So what we do? We define, we define uh, possible values, the future values of y and the future values of u. Okay. And then we have this matrix of w's that are related with future values of u. And this matter, matrix pi, which is related with the natural response. So you can write this pencil of, uh, pencil of uh, predictors. Uh, in this way. So the vector of future y's is the matrix W that you can see here, multiplied by the vector of future u's, which is free at time t, plus the vector of future natural regimes, which is this matrix pi times the state at time t, plus some error. Okay, this is some error. And this error is orthogonal to the other times. As I told you, uh, if it is too complicated, forget about the error. Now, you can say, but how can I find this W1, W2, Pi1, Pi2, and so on? You can compute them, you can compute them uh, from A and B. You can look at the, at the slides that I have not shown. But in practice, what you do, you estimate these parameters using the squares directly, forgetting about the A and B polynomial. So you directly estimate them. So you don't have to do recalculations. Now, what you do, uh, what you do, I did something that I should not have done. So we have the, pencil of future models. So I rewrite my quadratic cost as uh, the norm square of future values of y. If I have a reference, this is y minus a vector of future values of the reference. Okay. Plus rho times the square of the future values of u. And uh, then uh, I know 
I will include here my model. So I replace Y by the model. And now I have everything in terms of U. Okay. If I if I get rid of this uh, noise term, if I get rid of this noise noise term, uh, I end up I end up with this stuff here. And I should have this should not be here. Okay. If he is zero, suppose that he is zero. Okay, so you have a quadratic function in terms of u, and you can optimize this quadratic function. So remember that the norm square is the vector transpose times the vector, and so on. So I expand my j this way, and I compute the gradient and equate to zero. Here I'm doing a uh, a different stuff. So I'm compute, comparing this with a quadratic function with mean at u star, and then I compute, I compare terms. Okay, now, let's not lose too much time in this. The important thing is that if you minimize j with respect to this vector u, you get that this vector u is this matrix M, which is raw. <coughs> sorry. So raw the weight on the square of the manipulated variables u times the identity plus w prime transpose that's m inverted okay if rho is bigger than zero then this is always this always has an inverse w transpose pi transpose s now the first term is just is just multiplied by a vector which is one zero 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 so the ut is nothing more than a vector of gains times st times the state okay so uh, ut is this vector f uh, making the internal product with s okay you can put the minus here or the minus there so quite similar to the lq uh, result. Now, uh, this is a simplified version of generalized predictive control. You can include an integrator and so on. And actually, you can do some plays, uh, some extra plays. Okay, but this is the essential things. Now, what happens? What happens is that for t equal to infinity. The closed loop poles that you get with this control law satisfy this term, this stuff here, okay? where AZ uh, and BZ are, don't get confused with uh, this AZ and BZ are the polynomials of the original Rx plan. Okay, suppose that, uh, for instance, your row your row, uh, they are the, the roots, that is to say, they are the stable roots of this polynomial, okay? The degree of A is bigger than the degree of B. So uh, what imposes the degree of this sum is A, okay? So if you have N poles, then here you have two N roots because you have AZ times AZ minus one. So you have two N roots of this equation. Okay, suppose that rho is very small, even zero. Okay, then your poles are the stable roots of bz, bz minus one. If all the, the zeros of the point are inside unit circle, then uh, your poles will be at roots of bz because they are the, the stable ones. But if there is one zero which is outside unit circle, then uh, b of z minus one or, or the corresponding z minus one will be inside unit circle because the, re the, the distance with the origin, if one is larger, the other will be the inverse is smaller. So uh, when rho is zero, your poles are placed either at the zeros of the original plant, if the, 
zeros uh, inside in the circle, or if they're symmetrical, so it, symmetric in the sense of z minus one of the inverse uh, when they are the zeros are outside in the circle. Okay, but this is only for t equal to infinity. Now, uh, what happens is that if you you don't never work with t equal to infinity, you have you work with sufficiently large t to have a good approximation for this. But you can see that um, for t large enough, then you will have a stabilizing controller. This, this is one of, of the things that comes from enlarging the horizon. Now, you can also do another thing, which is, if in the end I'm going to have a, a feedback of the state as control, well, maybe I could from the beginning assume that I have some uh, vector, constant vector from t plus one up to t plus capital T minus one. And I can, um, uh, I can express all future uh, use as this feedback. And then I use predictors to predict my y's. And after some computations that I'm not going to change to show, uh, you your predictive your predictive model at time t plus i given observations up to time t does not involve all the future use, but just u t because you are assuming that from time t plus one up to the end it will be a constant vector. Okay. Uh, for do, doing this, you also have to uh, make uh, have predictors for u. So you have these two algorithms. In one of the algorithms, what you do, what you do, GPC, GPC, you estimate these parameters W and Pi using least squares, and then, and then compute this gain, F given by this stuff here, by this stuff here, okay, and you apply this control law. Or, Another possibility, you estimate these uh, linear models, linear predictive models. Okay, again, you have T, but the difference is now that uh, it does not depend on future use, and you have to estimate future use also. So you have to predict, to estimate theta i, psi i, mu i, and phi i. And then, and then, uh, use a controller that, uh, I'm sorry, I, I have not written it here, but it's similar to that one. Let me give you two examples of this controller, okay? One of the examples is the control of this, um, this uh, the, the examples are with uh, actual plants in uh, projects in which I was involved personally as responsible. Uh, one of the examples is the control of this valve here. You can see the, the valve is in this box and you can see here the actuator of the valve. So this, ha this has the size of a man, okay? More than one and a half meters. Uh, and uh, it's controlling uh, a spray of water. So you, you in a boiler, uh, you are driving your steam to the turbine and um, it passes by a heat exchanger in which it receives some extra heat from the flue gases. Numa caldeira produz em vapor, esse vapor passa por um permutador de calor chamado sobreaquecedor, onde recebe a uma troca de calor com os gases de queima, para aquecer mais e ter uma melhor, melhor rendimento no processo. But you cannot um, heat it too much. So you want to regulate the temperature. Why, why can't you heat it too much? Because if the steam is too hot, 
then it starts creating micro cracks in the pipes and the useful life of the plant is reduced. Okay. So there is, if you look at this uh, scheme here, the, the temperature is the horizontal axis and there is a barrier, there is a maximum temperature and you want to estimate, you want to exceed this by a very small probability term. Okay. Now, if your uh, steam fluctuates a lot, okay, you, you, will, you will need to have um, a controller. And how do you act on the steam temperature? You inject some water and you inject some water with this valve. Okay, so this valve allows you to inject more so-called spray water, in Portuguese, água de injeção, such that the temperature is decreased. And you have a temperature controller of the steam. Okay. This is a complicated process to control because there, there is significant delay. Now, if your control is not so good, you need uh, to place your stat point of temperature at this position A. And my set point is T star. T star means the set point, the reference temperature. And I have to place it here because the probability that I move to some places is such that I never go above the barrier, or I go above the barrier with the prescribed probability. Okay. Now, if I have a better controller, the fluctuations are smaller, so I can increase increase the set point without changing the probability of going above the barrier. So I'm increasing the average temperature by using a better controller. And when I increase the temperature of the steam, if the pressure uh, is and the flow are the same, the, I increase the energy and the energy is proportional to money. Okay? So by having a good controller, I'm able to increase the set point, keeping the integrity of my plant because I'm not violating this uh, temperature limit, and I'm able to uh, increase the, efficient, the global efficiency of the plant. So, producing more money with the same quantity of fuel bar. Now, you can see here some results. Above the set point is the straight line, and the line that is changing is the, the temperature of the steam. And uh, below is the position of the valve. And you can see that uh, up to this point A, this first error, A, uh, the standard PID controller, actually it was uh, a cane of PI, PIs that was being used, was carefully uh, tuned by the plant personnel that was very competent. And you have these fluctuations here. Now we turn on the adaptive controller uh, based on the second strategy. So the adaptive predictive controller, you have some transient, but then you see, compare these fluctuations with the fluctuations here, okay? Now we, you disconnect it and it benefits from the stabilizing effect, but it's still much larger, okay? So you are reducing the fluctuations by, uh, a significant uh, amount. You can see here between uh, this time and time B that the fluctuations are a little bit higher than here. What happens? I'm changing my raw, my weight on the manipulated variable, reducing it, so I reduce the offset. Uh, I'm also making the controller more ag agile. So uh, it compensates better, it approximates better the minimum variance control, but still being a predictive controller. The price I'm paying is that uh, I'm changing the valve um, uh, more. Okay, so the, the signal for the valve is dirty, dirtier than in this, uh, in this initial part. But uh, this was acceptable for plant personnel. This was has been uh, working for several months, and then it was disconnected because we were using a 
a separate computer from the standard um, standard computer of, of the plan. Okay, so this is one example. Another example, the control of temperature in a parabolic uh, uh, through uh, solar field temperature uh, controller. Okay, that I'm not going to to speak more, but it's the same the same technique. Now, any question? I would like to, to, to speak to you a little bit about constraints. And um, in these cases, we had not uh, any, we had not, we had no constraints. So we could find an explicit expression for the feedback gains. In general, you have constraints. So let me give you two examples. Actually, uh, to let me go back a little bit to the cost. Okay. So uh, where is the cost? Sorry. Okay, the cost. Forget about the, the, the stochastic effects. Okay. What you want to do? You want to minimize this cost and to find out the sequence of use, minimizing this. Okay. But minimizing this subject to what? Subject to um, First of all, the model. Okay, so one trick that you can use is uh, instead of using uh, input-output models that are quite nice when you work with uh, recursively squares, uh, you can uh, assume that you know your model just so non-adaptive predictive control, and uh, you compute the feature values of y using a state model. Uh, so. Uh, X will appear here because Y is CX. And uh, you minimize this with respect to X and U. But then you impose a constant, you impose a constraint, which is X and U are related by the, mo the plant model. Okay? X, K plus 1 equal to AX plus DU. And uh, in this way, uh, it's it's very practical to uh, to solve the problem, and you can use, for instance, software like uh, fmincon, one uh, one function of MATLAB to constrain minimization. Okay, so uh, you are minimizing the cost with respect to some constraints, but you can also impose constraints. Suppose that you have um, to have uh, a, a car that moves and you know that some positions are occupied by say columns or some obstacles so uh, you have a constraint which is a geometrical constraint that tells you that your uh, position should never be in the forbidden position so you write it as a constraint so uh, using fmincon, you can easily solve this problem. Let me show you uh, two two examples of this, just to give you a general idea. So I will stop sharing. We shall share. Stop sharing this one. Uh, Maybe screen share. So, can you see uh, my slide? Vehicle dynamics. Yes. Okay.
بگذار دیس مای انیمیشنز دو نات ورک There is a conflict with. Uh, okay, so I, I cannot show you this uh, this sequence of uh, slides, but I will show another one. Just a moment. It's a pity. Let's see if we can see this one. Okay, this is, uh, can you see the slide? Sit, uh, situation 10? Yes. Okay. Uh, so what is the idea here? You have uh, a team of uh, um, agents that are football players, soccer players. And um, you model, you control the motion of each player using uh, MPC. So uh, you see here the cost function. Okay, I'm not going to speak about the details of all of this. Actually, I don't remember some of the details. You see, I was looking at this here. Okay, where does this come from? I do not remember because I was supervising this thesis some time ago. But you can see here, for instance, uh, the velocity constraint on the velocity, horizontal and vertical velocities. A constraint on the position, okay, and um, also constraints uh, related to the fact that uh, one player cannot move uh, along the other, uh, over the other, and so on. And uh, we have uh, a number of MPCs. Each of the MPC uh, is related to one of the players, and you have the uh, attackers and the defenders, okay. And let me show you one example of a situation in which uh, we have uh, two strikers and one defender. I hope this works because, oops. How can I, how can, you know, how can I uh, go to a link? Uh, if you right click on top and, uh, or control and then click, you can. Control click, okay. Yeah, exactly. Maybe it works. Okay, thank you. Okay, so this is each of these of these players. The, the uh, but we cannot see. You are only sharing the PowerPoint. Okay, okay. Because I should share my. Sorry. I should share. Which one is my screen? Screen. No, can you see it? Yes. Okay, let's see from the beginning. Okay, each of the players is a triangle, and the ball is the, the black point, and they are being controlled with MPC. Okay, so the, the trick is that you should be able to formulate your problem as a cost, an adequate cost function, not necessarily a quadratic one. Okay, and um, you see that in this case, you could uh, get the ball and, uh, okay, even though you failed. Okay, let me show you another one. Uh, so you should translate your, you should translate your, your objectives in terms of cost functions and constraints. Okay, so you should learn how to speak another language, which is not Portuguese or English, but it's cost functions and uh, um, constraints to to be able to uh, to get the situation. So 
let me stop this. Okay, this is another situation I wanted to show you. Let's see what happens. Okay, the the red wing. We also have uh, we have movies in which the blue wing. Okay, so let me try again the first one. Let me try again the first one. Let me see if we can. So I will close this one. I don't want to have this. Okay. So. I closed what I should not have closed. Just give me one moment. moment. This work is supervised by myself on the use of MPC. Can you see it? Yes. And now, can you see it? Yes. Yes. Okay, so this is the, the control of this uh, vehicle. It's just a kinematic model, okay? Uh, better than the tricycle, it's more commonly referred as unicycle model. So you have Two, uh, two wheels. It's a very simple model of a vehicle, one of the simplest models, although it's not linear. So the, the objective is here to go from one point to the other. Okay. Can you see it? Now we have, uh, we have an obstacle. It sees the obstacle and it goes around it. Now let's enlarge the horizon. It's it's much smoother because it starts seeing the horizon, uh, the, the obstacle um, from further away. If the horizon is very small, I don't have the simulation here, but we have done it. Uh, you can get stuck because uh, you approach too much the obstacle and the problem becomes non-convex. Actually, it becomes a saddle point and you are stuck there. Now with multiple obstacles. Uh, in this case, with um, increasing the horizon, he, he tries to avoid as much as possible the obstacles. I, I don't have a reason for this one, for this behavior. Okay, but he, he, in all these cases, we are optimizing now, moving obstacles. Now, if the obstacle comes in its direction. Professor, a question. Mm -hmm. uh, in the case of uh, moving obstacles, do we consider also a motion model for the obstacle moving? No, actually, in this, you, you could. But in this case, it's just, um, in this case, it's just, uh, here you enlarge the horizon, you see that uh, it has a different behavior. But it's uh, just a sequence of static observations. You could do a prediction and take advantage of that. Okay? But okay. it's not done here. But in principle, you could. If you knew the position of the obstacle, for instance, you can combine this 
with uh, the solution of a prediction problem. And uh, there we go in the, the first, very first question made at the beginning of this class. Uh, what, what to study the prediction for, okay? You can uh, sometimes combine pure predictions you, because you can act on the obstacle, but you can predict its motion and uh, act in order to avoid it. Now this is another another example in which two vehicles are carrying a bar. They have to cooperate to carry a bar. So there is a constraint. You model this as a constraint between the position of the two vehicles. Now, oops, we have a problem, but uh, they have to go like carrying a table in a small corridor. And this is a situation in which you have a stream and you have to put a bar on the stream. The part of crossing the stream is not so evident. One passes, then the other passes, and so on. Okay. Now, this is a situation in which um, the drag before the stream and after the stream is different. And everything here is done with predictive control. Non-adaptive, this is non-adaptive predictive control, okay? So uh, we stop here. If I'm able to stop this, okay? Uh, any time for a very quite, uh, quick question? If not, okay, so we'll, we will meet again next week. Bye-bye. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Just um if i have any questions or doubts uh solving uh problems can i send you an email sure <laughs> okay